Welcome back to Milan Recording Studios. My name is James Pavel Chakras, and in today's video on the Piano Forever, we have inside of this box something that I am incredibly excited for, and honestly an instrument that from everything I've heard is going to be truly incredible. What is inside of this nondescript, slightly weather-beaten box is none other than a Krumar 7. Yes, the Krumar 7, the pretty legendary instrument that Krumar has come out with within the last few years, and everyone has been asking me to review it. I've had lots and lots of requests, especially once I reviewed the SV2 from Korg. I had lots of requests to review the Krumar 7, which is one of the SV2's very few competitors. Um, so for those of you who are uninitiated and don't know what a Krumar 7 is, I wanted to take a little moment to explain what exactly this instrument is. For those of you who know what it is, you'll be bored by this segment, but some of you may not know what this instrument is and why it's so cool, so I just wanted to take a brief moment to explain this. So first of all, in the world of digital pianos, most digital pianos are quite common mass-produced instruments. You've got, for example, one of my favorites in the $1,500 price range, the Yamaha P515. They make hundreds of thousands of these things, and you can find them at basically every single music store that you walk into and if you don't have it there on the on the floor they can probably order it for you the Krumar 7 is not an instrument like the P515 or even something more expensive like the MP11 SE or even something from Nord it is much much less of a production instrument and according to a, a label on the side of the instrument it is supposedly handmade in Italy so this is a very premium instrument just on the location of where it's made alone it's an incredibly interesting instrument and on top of that it's for a very specific market again the p515 is made for everyone Everyone who wants to know how to play the piano can enjoy a P515 or a similar instrument that's mass-produced like that. You know, the Kawai of the similar price bracket or whatever have you. The Krumar 7 is not an instrument like that, and of course the price of this instrument alone would kind of sh uh, tell you that. The Krumar 7 is a niche instrument. It's for a very, very specific small portion of the digital piano market, which is another reason I find it fascinating. The only mainstream instrument that I know of that's really been able to do this well is the Korg, the SV-1 and now the SV-2. The SV-1 and the SV-2 both tried to take over this exact same marketplace, and they did it with very, very good success, which is why the Krumar 7 and also the Viscount Legend 70s are very popular as well, because they also fit that same role. What is this role? It's the role of a digital piano that's made with modern components and modern technology, but that replicates the sound of vintage electric pianos. And even more specifically, not only is it geared towards replicating things like a Rhodes and a Wurlitzer and Clavinet and other instruments, but both the Krumar 7 and the SV2 have no screen. They have no LED panel or LCD screen, none of that. They have a completely physical button and dial user experience, which I think is very, very fascinating. The Korg SV-1 and SV-2 did it absolutely excellently, and it's very, very intuitive. And from everything I've seen, the, Cor the Krumar 7 is also extremely easy to use and incredibly intuitive. They're, they have a very interesting layout with buttons and lights and all that stuff. So I'm very, very excited to get this open. It's such an interesting instrument, and it also looks kind of vintage, too. The Krumar 7, unlike the SV-1 and SV-2, in my opinion, um, has a lot more of a vintage look. It's got this flat top, which which a lot of people like because they can stack a keyboard on top of it and it just kind of rem reminds me of a Rhodes. I'm gesturing over there because I have a Rhodes in that direction, a real 1973 Rhodes. The uh, the Krumar 7 reminds me of a Fender Rhodes or a Wurlitzer. It has that same shape and that same style. So let me get this thing out of the box and let me show you how cool this is. And it even comes with its own stand. We'll see how good that is. It might be flimsy. It might not be. It's only just four metal legs. So we'll see how well that works. Sadly, I can't do an unboxing video because this is an interesting box that opens up from the side and you pull the instrument out. So I can't really do a, a good unboxing video of it for you. But what I will do is take it out of the box off camera, which I think some of you will like more anyways. And then I'll get it out on the stand. I think I'll probably put it on it, the keyboard stand I have here already. Just put it on that and then maybe we'll test out the included stand later. Not sure what I'm going to do with that yet, but I really want to get that out of the box. So I'm going to do that and I'll be right back with the Krumar 7 out of the box. So now I've gotten the Krumar 7 out of the box and out of the foam, but as you can see, 
I still have some more unpackaging to do. It was packaged very, very nicely, and in my, I wouldn't say it's a quest to find the best keyboard or anything, but in my exploration of the digital piano market, um, I have encountered many different brands of keyboards who all package their instruments slightly differently. For a long time, I'd say that Kawhi was one of the best manufacturers as far as an unboxing experience goes. They label the foam pieces so you know where they're supposed to go, and it's all very well thought out, and also very well protected. And for a long time, as I said, I'd say Kawhi was the best best unboxing experience of keyboards. The unboxing experience for the Kumar 7 isn't as smooth as a Kawhi product would be. It didn't come out of the box as gracefully as a Kawhi product would be, but it was probably protected as good, if not better, than any Kawhi product I've reviewed so far. I'll put some pictures up on the screen here of the box and the way the Kumar 7 sits inside of the box. As you can see, there's these big rectangles of foam that go all the way around the Kumar 7. This means to put the foam on and off, you have to take the instrument all the way out of the box Box, put the foam on and then put it back in the box if you wanted to transport it although that's really not necessary as you can see here it's got this nice wooden external hard shell that protects it very well um the foam pieces are kind of interesting as well um they're really thick and sturdy I mean you know this is really incredibly protective and weirdly enough they're sticky so they like I had an end over here that was loose and it was just you look at they stick it's so strange, I've never seen that before. So they use sticky foam blocks to protect the instrument, and the unboxing experience was a little bit cumbersome, but honestly excellent. I had no major complaints. This instrument, the reason I say it's cumbersome is because this instrument weighs 53 pounds, so it is no lightweight. But at the same time, it is nowhere near as heavy or as bulky as an original stage model Fender Rhodes would be, probably around double that weight for a real Fender Rhodes. Despite being lighter and more easy to carry around than a real Fender Rhodes, you can see that Krumar is really going after that vintage look. Um, it, I mean, obviously it's different. The hardware is different. The uh, it's not Tolex on the outside. It's a different kind of like a um, a different kind of a hard plasticky material covering the plywood. Um, but the shape and the styling of it as a whole is very very similar to that of a original stage Rhodes. So they're really going after that that retro that vintage style, and that's why. I say this is for a very niche market. Not everyone wants to have a 70s styled digital piano on stage when they perform or even in their house, but those who are really into it really dig the look of the Krumar 7, and honestly, I think it looks pretty fantastic. Before I flip this over and take it apart and show you some more things about it, not take the actual instrument apart, but get it open so you can see the keys and all that, um, I wanted to talk about the owner's manual really quick. and. It's kind of interesting because most digital piano manufacturers, there's a few small exceptions, but most of them that I found usually will have a pretty bulky book, usually in four to five different languages, explaining how to use the keyboard and how to do simple things like plug it in and turn it on and select a sound. Krumar doesn't bother with any of that. There could be another manual hidden inside of this um, case, which maybe I'll get to in a little bit if there is one, but so far in the box, the closest thing I found to a manual is this. One sheet of paper is all you need to operate the Krumar 7. This side of it that says Krumar 7 is simply a quick guide and is basically basic do's and don'ts. You know, do not take apart the instrument, don't get it wet, things like that. Um, notes about the wooden structure, here's something that might be important for some of you if traveling by airplane ever becomes a thing again. Krumar 7's wooden enclosure is not compliant with ATA regulations, so it can't, su as such, it can't be loaded in the hold of a plane without a proper ATA case. It's great that they let you know that, but also kind of strange that the hard case itself isn't viable for taking on an airplane, but it's good that they let you know. So you didn't get all the way to the airport and then, oh, can't take your Krumar 7. So on the back side of here is basically Again, there could be another owner's manual, but on the back side of this is all you need to know to operate the Krumar 7. It says using the R illuminated RGB encoders, which I'll get to later on when I operate the instrument. They talk about what the color codes for those mean and how to operate those, and then also how to use the presets. I told you the Krumar 7 was going to be simple to operate. Again, there could be a new another owner's manual in there, but that is the most basic and the most bare bones owner's manual of any instrument I've ever found, and I'm not even mad about it. I think that's really cool, because um, they've made it so intuitive that you don't need to dig out the owner's manual to figure out how to select a sound or change a sound. I think that's pretty cool. All right, so let's flop this over onto its uh, underside here. And I'm going to open it up, show you how it's all packaged inside of there, and then I think after that we'll do some other stuff. So let's do that. 
So, the Kumar 7 is on its stomach now, its underside is down here, so I think it's time to open it up. But before I do that, I did want to talk about a couple of small little minor, minor defects I'm finding. There is a small little chip here in the covering for the plywood case. I can see that underneath of it is plywood. Hopefully you can see that little white thing there. That's where the covering has been chipped away. Also, the screw was incredibly loose. I was able to just go like this with my finger and just kind of work it deeper into the wood. So hopefully, I don't think that's a structural thing. I think that's just to hold like a couple of straps on the other side for it. So hopefully that's the smallest structural and physical issue I find with this. Not a big deal. I'm honestly not too upset. It is a hand-built instrument according to the side of the thing. Um, but I just wanted to mention that. Also, the little like cover for the strap here is loose. The other side isn't and it's fine, but there's if you take this off, there's two screw holes, two screws underneath of that, and that's how they mounted the handle to it. And then this cover went over it to hide those screws. So that's loose and can flop around. Again, not a big deal, but just something I noticed. I'm again, I don't really mind it. These little handles here, these latches, uh, are absolutely wonderful though, I do have to say. They have, again, a very vintage kind of a style. Uh, you see these type of latches a lot in modern equipment as well, but they are somewhat reminiscent of the latches you'd find on a Fender Rhodes. They're not the same type of latches, but it's the same style, it's the same idea. You've got the square top that goes on top of the keyboard, and once I open this up, we will see the Kumar 7 itself. That lid is actually a lot heavier than I expected it to be, and part of that is because the legs are actually right up here. So I'm going to take this lid off, I think, and then we will check out the instrument itself. It smells like dry erase markers inside. You guys remember the dry erase markers for a whiteboard that you write on a white? It smells like the ink for dry erase markers in here. So strange. It reminds me of childhood. Such an unusual scent for the inside of a box. And also there's two cut zip ties. So this is so quirky and amazing. Oh, these zip ties were actually for up here for the for this and I guess they broke or snapped or something. But anyway, let me get this lid off and then we'll check out the legs in a little bit. But I got to take this plastic off for the 7 as well, so we'll do that and then I'll be right back. So I know that you guys are dying as much as I am to actually hear this thing play, but it's such a unique designed and special instrument that I really wanted to take a few more moments to discuss the build quality and the actual physical appearance of this instrument. Uh, right now I've got the Krumar 7 under this blanket with the lid of it on top of it upside down because I wanted to talk about the lid as well as the legs and all that stuff. So first of all, the legs. I ha was wondering, I didn't think, but I was wondering if perhaps these legs that are included, and of course there's four of them, maybe would would be a little flimsy. I was thinking they might be hollow aluminum. I was thinking they might get dented easily. No, you, you could use this as a baseball bat. It's got some heft to it. It is solid aluminum, certainly in the top. It feels lighter towards the end, so it might be a little more hollow, but I don't think so. I think it's probably a solid aluminum all the way through with a steel thread here at the end. Uh, it is extremely high build quality, maybe even a better build quality than the original fender legs for the stage roads. I didn't really like the legs on the stage roads. They were a pain in the butt to put in and out, and while the roads itself is very stable, just the legs were an annoyance, and hopefully these won't be. They look beautiful, and I think the design of these is excellent. So, I'm so far I'm impressed. I'll see what happens when I go to put them in, but so far, I'm I'm happy with them. Let me put this down and talk more about some other interesting things. Another interesting thing with the Krumar 7 is the case that the legs come in. As you can see here, we have a simple um, cloth, kind of a plasticky cloth case that has four slots, one for each of the legs. You've got a Velcro pouch on either end, so you can put your legs in there, which is really fantastic. And here's a couple of funny quirks. First of all, the case is just a generic made in China bag. And here's something else that's even funnier. And I love this. This is hilarious. They left the sticker. They left the tag on it. So they bought this probably online somewhere. It says Boston Musical Instruments. And then un on upside down text, it says bass and straps for professionals. They left this on. And that is so hilarious and I love it, and I'm going to leave that on. That's going to stay there for the rest of the life of this thing. I find that absolutely funny. Uh, the bag is made in China, but honestly, the build quality seems okay. It seems pretty to be, to be pretty tough, and I mean, it's a bag for carrying the legs. That's, I'm happy with it. Um, so as you can see, you may be thinking that this is an excellent road-worthy keyboard, especially if it sounds as good as I've heard it sound online. Um, but there's a few little flaws here that I wanted to discuss. First of all, I already mentioned one of them, and that's that in the owner's manual, or can I even call this a manual? This sheet of paper. Uh, 
Uh, it says, Krumar 7's wooden enclosure is not compliant with ATA regulations, so you need a case for the Krumar 7 to load it onto an airplane. Which is kind of funny because it already comes with a case. So it's a keyboard in a case, but you need another case for the case to load it onto an airplane. Um, that, I think, could be a little bit of a design flaw. Now, I'm not well-versed in the regulations of the ATA. I don't know what's required. You Maybe it's impossible to do that in a reasonably sized keyboard case. I don't I don't know. Uh, to be a, in a, an integrated keyboard case. Um, maybe that's too difficult or too expensive. Uh, but you'd think they would at least try to get that, so then you wouldn't need a separate case for your Kumar 7. Not a massive design flaw. I like that they disclose that right in the sheet of paper that you see as soon as you open the box. That is very well done. Um, but it would have been great if the case was compliant and you could just toss it on the airplane and go. Um, but the bigger design flaw is actually with the lid here. Um, and again, it's it's not it's not massive. You could easily use some Velcro straps to make this work. But again, you'd think it would come this way straight out of the box. So let me tilt this up here. This weighs 10 pounds, by the way, 10 and a half pounds. So not super, super heavy, but also not super light, um, but very manageable. And then this is where the case goes. Now, I just dropped it on the floor. Let me grab it. That was a mistake on my part. So this case goes here, if it'll stay there. This case goes in here, you put your four legs in it, and it goes there. How do you fasten it? Well, out of the box, as you saw earlier, there were two broken zip ties and then two other zip ties holding this in here. So originally Krumar used zip ties, but they didn't include any other forms of attachment. You'd think they'd include some kind of a Velcro strap that could come in here and hold this in place while it's on the road. You could just toss it in there and put the lid on top, but it would flop around and damage your instrument, so that's not ideal. Um, and they just used this basic, like, metal box here that isn't even quite perfectly straight. I think it used to be a little bent, and then I bent it back in shape. Um, but it's just this basic metal box. Now, again, not terrible. It's nice that it's metal, you know, it's durable, and all it takes is some Velcro straps. But... I thought it would be fun to show you guys how a real Rhodes did it back in the 70s because this is so closely emulating a stage Rhodes, not only in sound but also in appearance, that I thought it would be cool to take a trip back to the 70s and see how it was done back then. Now I do have one small disclosure here to make with this Rhodes lid. This technically does not belong to the proper model of Rhodes. This does not belong to the stage Rhodes, which the Krumar 7 is shaped like. This instead belongs to our suitcase model Rhodes. Our stage model Rhodes, we do have one at the studio, um, but and while because the suitcase model is better, we don't use the stage model as much as an instrument. And as a matter of fact, it's being used as a table right now, and it's being used as a stand for our 56 channel mixer with no stability problems at all. And the mixer probably weighs as much as the Rhodes does. Some of you may laugh, but yes, that's what I'm using my stage Rhodes for, so I'm not taking the mixer off just to get the cover off. Um, so what we have here instead is the Rhodes for the, the cover for the suitcase Rhodes. So first of all, something I forgot to mention about the Kumar 7's lid is that the wood on the case is half an inch thick. The wood on the case for the original 73 Rhodes is actually a little bit less than three quarters of an inch thick, so we'll just say three quarters of an inch. So that alone means the lid weighs twice as much, exactly twice as much. This weighs 20 pounds, the other um, lid weighed a little more than 10 pounds. Um, you can also see that it's a lot deeper as well, little just physical differences. The Rhodes was a bit of a beast of an instrument. If I tilt this up so you can see it better, it's much more unwieldy, a lot harder than you'd think 20 pounds should be. Uh, you can hopefully see on the inside here that this is how, on the stage model Rhodes, Fender decided to fasten the, uh, the the things. Now you could probably put the legs in here, as a matter of fact. Uh, of course the suitcase model didn't actually technically come with legs, but the Fender legs probably would have fit in here. The original stage model actually had a bag very similar to the Krumar 7. It wasn't made of, and it is a Chinese bag, but it's pretty high quality. It wasn't made of that nice durable fabric. It was actually made of like a rubbery Tolex material that tore very easily and Honestly, it was pretty terrible. However, the original stage Rhodes had straps very similar to these that basically, I can actually move this, the original stage Rhodes had straps just like these that would bolt down to the bottom of this and you could put your bag of legs in there and use these straps to affix it. Um, I doubt it would be, it would add that much to the cost of the Kumar 7 to add straps like this. A Bach could be even cooler, but that would be more expensive. So I doubt it would be very difficult for them to add some straps to the actual Kumar 7 and be able to have that um, case of legs be strapped to the inside. So I just thought I'd show you that. This is how the original Rhodes was done, and Krumar 7, Krumar has already taken so much inspiration from the original Rhodes, 
why not take a little more and copy the way their legs were fastened in. Uh, it was very, very well designed, and this box is, of course, very sturdy here. Like I said, the suitcase model didn't have legs per se, um, but it did have some owner's manuals and stuff that went in here, so that's what would have gone in here. Um, so that's just a look at the real roads, and as you can see, it's a bit different, but the Kumar 7 has the same idea. Again, it'd be great if they could implement straps like this to the Kumar 7 and make it a whole lot better. So now we have the Kumar 7 completely out of the box and the packaging, and we're all done with the unboxing and unpackaging part of this video. And as you can see, it looks very interesting. Now I feel like there may be two different groups of people who have differing opinions on the looks of the Kumar 7. I feel like there might be a group of people who think it doesn't look good, and I think there also might be a group of people who think it looks good. And I am in the group of people who think it looks good. In fact, I go a step further and say that I think it looks phenomenal. Uh, I think it looks really, really cool. It's a very interesting keyboard that manages to look both modern and retro at the same time. It looks modern because you've got this beautiful LED light over here for the 7 logo, which is absolutely gorgeous, by the way. You've also got the bright white, uh, not white, but you've got the brightly colored crisp LEDs here for the lights, uh, for the buttons, and then also the knobs are actually RGB. As you turn these, they slowly change hues from green to red, and we'll talk more about that later on in the video. Um, so it looks both modern and vintage because it also has the vintage shape and the retro styling of the original Fender Rhodes. A little bit different, but it's the same basic idea. And it also has those retro style stage legs, which we'll talk more about later on in the video too. And those also help it give a vintage um, look. So I think it's a really fascinating looking keyboard. There's virtually none other on the market like it. The only other one that's similar would be the Viscount Legend 70s. Maybe someday I'll do a video on that one, but of course they are quite expensive. So if you guys enjoy this video definitely make sure to go ahead and give it a like and support the channel as much as you can um for the kumar 7 for how to operate it it's about as simple as you can get and there's a reason that there's only one little page about how to operate the kumar 7 in the owner's manual um in that page they talked about what these knobs do and how to make them do what they do and that's it for operation. They didn't tell you how to turn the instrument on or how to plug it in or how to change the sounds. They just left all that up for the owner to figure out because it's about as simple as you can get. So what I'm going to do is briefly run through the user interface and show you all how that works and then we will do a bit of a playing test. So on the left here for the knobs you have the volume and this knob controls the volume. It's about as simple as that. The next knob to the right is the reverb, and this controls the reverb of the instrument. If you push and hold it, after 100 milliseconds, the knob will activate, as you can see. So you don't have to hold it for very long. It's a very, very nice length of amount of time. On the SV2, you can push and hold buttons to activate special functionalities, and you have to push and hold them for a good two seconds before they do anything. This here is 100 milliseconds, so it's hardly any longer than pushing it once. Uh, and it's a very, very nice time, and it's pretty easy to do that mid-performance as well. Um, so when you have it on this green setting, when the little indicator light is on the level, this is changing the level of the reverb, and the color of the light will change from green to red. So if you crank this all the way up here, it will eventually change through yellow, through orange, and then eventually you'll land on red. As you can see, we have a massive, massive amount of of area to play with. You have a massive amount of control over these knobs, which is both a blessing and a curse. It's great because you have an infinite amount of control practically, and you'll never be, oh, I wish I could get that to be in between this setting and that setting. You won't find that on here. Um, but it also takes forever to minimize or maximize an effect, so that is a little bit of annoyance, but honestly, I think it's pretty worth it. While the button is on, if you tap it once, the button will turn purple, and it will fade to, I believe, from purple to a dark blue, and that is changing your decay, so how long it takes the reverb de to decay. Push and hold it for 100 milliseconds, and it will turn off. So as you can see, it's really quite easy to use. Um, up here is the EQ, and I think I'll talk more about this in the video if I remember to. It's a bit quirky. Um, but again, you push and hold this. After 100 milliseconds, it comes on. You use this button to toggle between the bass and treble frequencies and the middle and mid frequency EQ. Um, so that changes that. And then once again, when you're on here, this, I believe, would be the bass, and this, I believe, would be the treble. And you can turn those, and they'll fade from green to red to indicate how far along they are. You've got two little buttons here. This one here is for transposing. You push and hold it, and you push a key on the keyboard, and then it will transpose it all the way up to whatever key you're at. So then middle C will be that key. And then this down here is a button that's specifically only for the clavinet sound. If we go to the clavinet sound and hold it down, you'll see a bunch of lights light up. These are for changing and customizing the sound of the clavinet. 
This here is your bank sounds, which is also involved in um, setting favorites as well. Uh, there's a little procedure you can do to set favorites to other banks. So if you customize a sound and you really like the way that sounds, you can save it to a favorite and recall it again at any time, which is great. These buttons here are for selecting your sounds, and it's about as easy as you get. You push the Tines button for the Tines sound. You push the Reeds button for the Reeds sound. Electric Grand for the Electric Grand sample. You get the idea. And I said sample, but I actually misspoke because this is actually a physical modeling electric piano. So everything in here is not sampled, but rather digitally modeled, which is very, very interesting. So these control your sounds, and it's about as easy as you can get. Over here, you have your effects. So this is your one effects. You also have an amp simulator, and you've also got another group of effects over here. Again, push and hold it for 100 milliseconds. It will turn on. You can then toggle it between changing the depth and the rate so the rate is how fast it will do a tremolo or do an auto pan or do an auto wah and then you can also change a pedal wah as well so which will be either when you push the note harder it'll wah more or you can also have it connected to an expression pedal um, you can push this button to toggle between which effect it's actually changing and you can push this button to change again between depth and rate So that's really fantastic. The amp slash drive simulator is pretty self-explanatory You turn it on and as you increase it as you go from green to red You're gonna be increasing the drive of this simulated amp uh, I can't really say that it truly sounds like running it through an amplifier It doesn't really sound like that But it does give it a very gritty sound especially when you max that out and it makes it sound really really interesting So I'll probably show you that later. There's also been a nice attention to detail with this knob, but I'll touch on that later. Um, a lot of things I'm going to be touching on later. Hopefully I remember to do them all. Over here you have the second effects. It works the same as the first effects. Push and hold it. It turns on. Push it once to toggle between depth and rate. In this section you have a chorus, a phaser, a flanger, and a delay to choose from, and they all sound pretty cool. The last knob over here is the pad. So if you t touch and hold this, it turns on. This adds in an extra synth pad to whatever sound you're playing. So you can change the level of it, how loud the pad is, and also if you tap it once while it's on, you can blend it as well to blend how loud your original sound is and how loud the pad is, which is quite nice. Don't really find myself using that feature all that much. The pad doesn't really sound that amazing to me, but perhaps in the right circumstance, I would find it very helpful. So that has been a quick little overview of how to use the Krumar 7. As you can see, it's pretty much about as simple as you can get, and uh, there's not really any major problems. Um, so as far as the build quality is concerned, that's kind of an interesting thing to talk about as well. This is a very pricey instrument. It's not at the tippy-tippy top of pricing when it comes to stage pianos. The Nord Grand or the Dexy Bell Vivo S9 uh, is a lot more expensive than this, but it's still up in the higher tiers of digital pianos. And you'd expect the build quality to be basically out of this world. And while the build quality is good, there's a few small things about it that I think could be improved. So first of all, the wood case. I don't really have any major complaints with that. I think the wood case that's covered in the very durable, almost like a truck bed liner type of thing, uh, is very, very durable. And I don't think you'd have any issues with that. If you dropped it on something hard, like a rock, it might crack or something. But uh, I don't think it, I think it would be very resistant against scratches and things of that nature. I think that is pretty solid. Uh, what isn't quite as solid though is actually this nice flat top. And you might be looking at this and going, oh, "If I get this, I could put another keyboard on top of it." Um, I wouldn't do that so fast, honestly. Uh, and I was hoping that when I got this, I'd do a review of it versus the SV2 and just slap the SV2 right on top of it and say, "Look what I can do with the Krumar 7." I'm not sure I want to do that because. The metal, it is metal, but on top of the Kumar 7, it's very, very thin. It is metal all the way across, uh, which is nice, but it seems thin. It's not like the thick, solid metal that Kawhi makes the MP11 out of. You knock on that, and it seems like it's this thick. I'm sure it's not, but it sounds like it is. Uh, this sounds like it's very, very thin. Uh, it's making a sound that I'm sounds familiar to me, but I can't think of what it sounds like other than just tapping on a hollow box of metal so that's what I'll say it sounds like it doesn't sound very thin and I really wouldn't I really wouldn't want to put anything heavy on there maybe a light synth or something or a light MIDI controller you could put on here um but I wouldn't want to put a full-blown keyboard with a weighted action on there I don't think that would be very smart you'd probably end up denting the top of it um and probably scraping it up so you might want to put a towel down as well um but however it is metal which is nice it also gathers fingerprints like crazy which is a little bit annoying and they don't like to come off so you can't see that in the video but it's got lots of fingerprints on already because it's natural to rest your fingers on it when you're pushing these knobs so then you get fingerprints all over it um other things that i dislike about the build quality are a couple of these buttons okay so first of all 
these knobs are fine. I like these knobs. They are a decent build quality. They're plastic, of course, because they're clear, but I have no issues with the build quality. It's these little rectangular buttons that I have a bit of an issue with, and they work fine. They're very responsive. You can toggle through them really nice and fast. Hopefully you can see that, uh, but you can, they're very responsive. Uh, but where the problem comes is how much slop there is, and there's a massive amount of, look, can you see this? Look at how much slop there is in, in this button. It's just wiggling all over the place. Um, and it's the same thing with all of these little rectangular buttons. There's four of them on the keyboard. And uh, when you push them, they wiggle and flop all over the place. And to me, the build quality on these buttons in particular seems very, very poor and very cheap for an instrument of this price point. But they do work and they are nice and sensitive, so I do have to say that for them. These buttons, however, I absolutely love. These have a great sound to them. They have a great feel to them. Unlike the similarly shaped buttons in the SV1 and SV2, they are incredibly responsive and they're absolutely amazing. I mean, the sound they make alone is really mechanical and awesome. They're just so satisfying to click and I absolutely love those. Uh, as far as buttons and switches, that's about it on the instrument. And as far as the overall build quality is concerned, those are honestly my really overall complaints with the instrument itself. The top metal is a little bit thin and these buttons feel very cheap and like they're probably gonna break in the future. As far as the external accessories that come with the Krumar 7, you have two power cables and a pedal unit. Why two power cables? Well, Krumar, in certain areas has put a lot of attention to detail and this is one of them. Not only did they include a USA style plug to be used here in the States, but they also included a European style plug for use in Europe. So it's totally compatible as long as you have this cable with anything in Europe or anything here in the States. I believe in different countries in Europe, they have different style plugs, so you'd need an adapter for that, um, but it would still work, which is absolutely wonderful and a really, really nice attention to detail. Again, this isn't particularly useful for me, seeing as I live in the United States, but it's still a really nice gesture and I really appreciate that. The other thing, of course, that comes with it is a damper pedal and I kind of have mixed opinions on it. Let me grab that and show it to you and talk a little bit about that. All right, so this here is the damper pedal that comes with the Krumar 7, and when you pick it up and you touch it and you feel it, it it just, ugh, it doesn't feel good. It feels light, it feels cheap and hollow and plasticky and feels like something that should come with a $500 keyboard, not something that can cost over 2000 Having said that, uh, it doesn't wander on the floor, and I haven't had any squeaky noises, and the pedal itself feels okay. A little bit cheap, but it feels okay. The manufacturer of this, it's branded Boston, and it says BFS-40 sustain pedal. If you remember earlier in the video, Boston was also the same Chinese company that made the case for the legs that goes inside of the Krumar. So it's kind of interesting. I was under the impression that it would come with a Fatar pedal, which is who makes the action for this, um, but perhaps either that's changed or Boston is a subsidiary company of Fatar. I'm not really sure. Um, so at the moment, I have mixed opinions. I don't like the quality of it. It feels really cheap, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if later on down the road it gets all kinds of squeaky noises, but for now it works great. And despite only having four tiny rubber feet on the bottom, it's sticking to the floor great and it's not wandering at all. So like I said, mixed opinions on this. Um, we'll have to see how it lasts. I plan on using this about every day. Uh, it's, I'll save my opinions for it later, but you can already tell I like it. Um, I've given away enough there. Um, but so we'll see how this Boston BFS 40 lasts. I've never heard of the Boston brand. I mean, I've heard of Boston pianos, but not pedals. and leg bags. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but that's been the pedal unit for the Krumar 7. Not bad, but could be better. Something else interesting about the Krumar 7 before we get around to playing it, which will be coming up very shortly, is where in the world were these even stored in the box? You saw the pictures of the box, you saw me pull it out of the box, but at no time did you ever see a bag of pedals and cables floating around. Well, that's because there's actually a hidden compartment within the Krumar 7 that these things were located. And this is just genius and I've never seen anyone do this before and I love it. It's so quirky and so unique and I love it. So let me show you the secret compartment that you can find over here. That's the door for it right now. It has a metal door. Let's go check it out. I usually tend to avoid the word quirks in my videos because there's a certain YouTuber on the internet who likes to use that word in his videos a lot and I don't want to be accused of stealing. But you have to admit that this is absolutely without a doubt extremely quirky. This is a giant cabinet on the inside of the Krumar 7 
And I mean, what other word can I use to describe it besides it's a quirk of it? I mean, it has a little metal plate that's the door and it comes completely off. You can see where it threads in. And this is where you store your pedal unit, both of your power supplies, and there's plenty of room for either padding material, which is what I should put in here, or perhaps some other things. And I think there's something else in there too, but we'll look at that in a little bit. Uh, so first of all, we've got the pedal unit. I've already talked about that, or I will talk about it in a little bit. Um, but we've got the pedal unit, and as you can see, it just barely fits in there. Um, so you got the pedal unit that fits in. Now, obviously, I don't think I need to say this, but if you're going to be transporting it, you'd want to put some padding material around this. In originally, they used like foam sheets, which worked perfectly. Um, I'd probably want to use cloth for myself, but again, this has very little clearance, so if you wrapped it up too thick, you might not be able to get it out easily. So depends. Well. You should, you know, do some experimenting of your own and see what works for you. You can also have the power cables in here as well. This is the European one. It's currently plugged in, so the American one is being used. Um, but there's that. And then also, I put this in there to save for later. It's a, it's a buddy bar. Uh, they're delicious. Anyway, uh, enough of that. But that is the cabinet on the inside. It's a little storage compartment. And it goes way back in there. They say not to put your whole arm in there because um, the edges are kind of sharp and it could get kind of stuck. Um, but it goes way deep in there and uh, it's very deep very big and plenty of space once you get past this entrance threshold um for your pedal unit and your power supplies and all that stuff and then once you're done taking it out you just slide this door in here and just screw it on and it'll just kind of usually find its own screw thread usually not too difficult and it's got nice fine thread so it takes a while to put on there but there you go nice and secure and you're ready to go so after checking out all of the features of the Krumar 7, I think now it's about time to get to listening to how it sounds. Um, I didn't really talk too much about the peripheral options over here on the side. You've got two different USB ports. You've got a, a DIN MIDI out. You've also got a switch that changes the level of the output. You can have it be on low, medium, or high, which is interesting detail I've never really seen. Of course, you have two proper direct line outs, and you've also got two options for sustain pedals. Not sustain pedals, but you've got one for sustain and one for an expression pedal as well. Now I think about time we check out how it sounds of course the Krumar 7 considering it looks just like a Fender Rhodes it makes sense that the main focal point of the, the Krumar 7 and where it shines the best I think is of course the Fender Rhodes sound labeled on the instrument as Tynes so let's have a quick listen to a brief little piece that I've sort of written and sort of taken uh, it's called Riders on the Demonetization Storm and of course you'll be able to hear where I get the inspiration for the song and the title for the song uh, let me just play the little beginning of it I've also expanded on it specifically for the Kumar 7 so we'll see how that goes I wrote it earlier didn't write it down we'll see if I can remember how it went It's not a finished piece, but I have expanded on it since the last time you guys probably heard me play that in a digital piano review. And as you can hear, the road sound on this Krumar 7 is very good. I don't want to say that it sounds exactly like a Fender Rhodes, and I also can't really say that it sounds like my suitcase model Rhodes, which has a bit of a brighter, thinner, more singing, little more sustaining sound. Um, but I do have to say that the Rhodes sound on the Krumar 7 is very, very good. It's definitely one of the best Rhodes sounds I have heard in a digital piano, and it honestly is really fantastic. Another reason it's so great for the Rhodes sound is actually this action, uh, which I believe is a little bit controversial. Uh, uh, in the world of digital pianos. There's a, some people, like I said about the appearance of the Krumar, uh, there's a few people who like the action on this, and then there's a few people who don't like the action. And I definitely see both sides. Okay, so first of all, the positives of this action. It is phenomenal, and I mean perf- they nailed 
the feeling of this action for playing road sounds. Uh, it it it's kind of like it's heavy, right? Like a real original Rhodes would have been. Um, stock out of the factory. It's kind of heavy. It's kind of fat feeling. It doesn't feel very what's the word? It it's responsive. You can play quick on it, but it doesn't feel responsive in the same way other digital piano actions do, like ones from Yamaha or Kawai. They have a much different. This has a much different feeling. It's a lot more heavier and it has more heft to it. It's very interesting. Um, when you play the notes hard, they jiggle at the bottom. When you push the key down hard, they they, they bounce. There's kind of a jiggle there, and it feels incredibly mechanical. Uh, it's really, really great for playing road sounds, and the response and the dynamic curve of the road sound mixed with the action just feels spot on. Um, earlier I was playing it, and I was playing it loud, and I was playing it hard, and just like on a real roads, my hand was getting very tired, just like it would be on a real, real roads. Um, so they absolutely nailed the feeling of the action and they nailed that sound as well. It feels and sounds really, really great. And the action and that road sound are a perfect match for each other, I think. Uh, it feels really great to play the road sound on there. It's it's hefty, it's heavy, it's meaty. You can really dig into it and it feels sturdy and supportive. Because of the heaviness of the action and because that road sound isn't super bright, kind of like mine is. Mine is a bit of a more bright, shrill sound. Um, you really have to dig into it and play it hard. And I'm hoping it will be a durable action. We'll have to see. It is made by Fatar, and there's a lot of people who say bad things about that company um, as far as their durability and longevity is concerned. Um, so we'll have to see. Uh, this will probably become my daily driver for a while, like I said earlier, and we'll have to see if an action or a key breaks or something malfunctions. You can, I can guarantee I'll be making a video about it. If it lasts me four years before it breaks, well, I'll be pretty dang happy. Um, so we'll have to see how well that action works. It feels nice and responsive, and it has a durable feeling to it. I will say that. The bad things about the action, uh, it's heavy. It is a, it's, it's quite substantial and some people might not like that. I practice on a piano that has a very heavy action that honestly is kind of reminiscent of this. It's quite heavy and substantial, but it gives me all the dynamic control I need. Dynamic control for other sounds outside of the tines, the reeds, the clavinet, which really doesn't have much um, dynamic control. Everything outside of that isn't as good with this TP100 action. Um, you don't have as good of a dynamic control you would have with other digital pianos. Again, I turn to Yamaha and Kawai, two of the makers of some of the best digital digital piano actions out there right now. Uh, it doesn't have that piano-like experience. So if you're looking for something that's gonna feel and sound, we'll get to that later, like a acoustic piano, you can just absolutely just kick the Krumar 7 right out of your list. It's a fantastic piano keyboard thing, um, but it's not like an acoustic piano and it doesn't sound like an acoustic piano. So just get that off your list immediately. If you're looking for something that has a vintage sound and a vintage feel, look no further than the Krumar 7. It's absolutely fantastic for that. Um, I really can't say enough positive things about the sound and the feel for the road sound of it. Uh, it's really great. Let me turn on the reverb and let me turn on the auto pan. And we'll play a little bit around with that and just play some random chords and just see how that sounds here on the Krumar 7. So those are the effect, the first group of effects on the Krumar 7. We can also take a quick listen to the second group of effects. I'm not going to do this for every single sound, but just to give you guys an idea of what these effects are and how you could use them, I'll try them out on the Tynes sound 
for the second group of effects too, which is a chorus, a phaser, a flanger, and a really cool delay. So let's check that out. As you can hear, you can do some really interesting sounds there, and the delay especially is probably my favorite one, along with the chorus sound in the second effects category. You can do some really interesting stuff with that, and at the right settings, it almost sounds like an additional reverb. I didn't play with the reverb much, so let me just play with that a little bit, and then after this, we'll move on to the next sound in the instrument. Now that's a pretty powerful reverb, of course you really probably wouldn't want it like that setting for most music, but I just wanted to push it towards its limits, it can still go more than that I believe. I just wanted to push it towards its limits to give you guys an idea of how the reverb itself sounds and listen to the reverb, it's very very good and I like the way it sounds. Now I love the sound of the tines and I like the sound of the reeds, you'll notice I said I didn't love them, they're good, they sound good, but not as good as I think they could be. Of course, these are modeled, so they're going to sound a little bit more artificial than if they were sampled from a really from a real reed electric piano. A reed electric piano, of course, the most famous one is the Wurlitzer. They had a number of different models, and the most famous one is the 200. The 200 was known for a rich, bright, gritty sound, and this has a gritty but also more of a warm, mellow sound. So it's kind of like it's between a 200 and a 200A. The 200A had a completely different sound. It was very soft and cottony. The 200 was bright and gritty, and this is kind of somewhere in between. So let me play a little bit on the reed sound. I turned off the amp drive. Uh, it, by default, it comes with that on. I think it sounds better with it off. So I'm going to turn it off and just play a little bit and let you guys listen to the reed sound.
So as you can hear, it sounds pretty good, but I think it could use a little bit more improvement. I think it could use a little bit more fatness to the tone and also maybe a slightly brighter edge. Um, I'm sure this is probably all stuff that can be customized as well, which is pretty cool because that's modeled and not simply sampled. Um, in this range right here, I think it could use a little bit more of a fatter, grittier sound. It has more of kind of a, a higher pitched metallic overtones to it, and I think it could use a little bit more boost in the low end. It has an EQ though. We'll talk about that in a second, but let me just play a few notes down here and you'll hear what I'm talking about. So that is the sound of the Wurlitzer, the Reeds uh, section by default. Now, of course, there is an EQ, so you theoretically could fix a lot of these problems with the EQ. Now, I don't know if I'm A, doing it wrong, or B, my unit is defective, but the EQ seems to do nothing for any of the sounds. Now, I'm not going to do it in the video for every single sound. I'll just use it on the Whirly because it's the one that I think needs the most EQ tweaking. Um, the way I believe it works is you push this for 100 milliseconds. It comes on. This is your bass knob when you're on the top, when your red LED is on the top setting here. This tweaks the bass. This tweaks the treble. If you push this and that light moves down, this becomes your middle. And then this other one says mid frequency, so that's kind of like the same thing. So I'm not really sure if I even understand it correctly. But I believe I understand the way it would work correctly. You turn these knobs and they go from green to red. And the red setting would be the most intense and the green setting would be the least intense, just like how these things work over here. So if I take the bass frequency, which I think could use a little more oomph, and I turn it all the way up so that it's red. And again, this is what I mean about blessing and a curse. It's great that you have this amount of control, but it takes forever to max out of control. That should be close to the maximum. Um, now if I turn on and off the EQ, it'll remember what setting I have it at. If I play some notes and turn on and off the EQ, listen to the difference we get. There's no difference that I can tell. Um, let's take this other knob and let's make this go into the red. It was already actually close to the red, so you know what? I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to go the other way and we're going to make the treble be green. Um, that's not actually what I think should happen. I think I should bring the treble up a little bit as well and bring out some of the brighter, higher partials. But just for the sake of the video, we're going to see why is it going red again? Come on. I think I'm accidentally spinning it the other way because I'm trying to go as fast as possible. Let's go into the green. There we go. We're approaching the green area now. So in theory, this should be... Why is it going red again? Please go green. All right, we'll just leave it there. That's. I think that's different from where we had it before. Um, there we go. I think when I was trying to spin it as fast as possible, I was accidentally spinning it the opposite way. There we go. That's what was happening. Let's get it nice and green here. So now in theory, we should have the treble frequencies be nearly gone and the bass frequencies nearly all the way up to their maximum. Let's have a listen to it. So I hear a slight difference in the treble um, and none at all in the bass. Um, with that amount of degree of motion, you'd think you'd be able to crank it way the heck up and turn it literally completely off. Um, so I don't know if I'm using it wrong or misunderstanding it, but the EQ doesn't seem to be terribly useful for me. However, I'm mostly happy with the sounds of the keyboards, the sounds in here, and typically even when I'm unhappy with sounds, I just don't use them rather than EQ them. So. It's not really a big deal killer for me, but it is just something odd I wanted to talk about. Um, that's the worldly sound of the Krumar 7. Overall, I like it. Could be a little bit better, but overall, it's pretty good. Now let's try out the next one, which is a sound that normally I'm not that big of a fan of. It's the Electric Grand, which is basically a Yamaha CP80. Typically, I'm not a big fan of these. I don't usually like intensely bright, thin-sounding musical instruments. But the Electric Grand on the Krumar 7 
it changes my mind. This is, it's both bright and warm at the same time. It's very interesting, it's very beautiful, and I really love the way it sounds. Uh, let me just play a few little things on it and you'll hear what I mean. It has an insane amount of sustain and a very interesting tone that honestly I adore. Uh, I think it sounds really, really good. If you hit it loud, it gets bright, but in my opinion, it's not too bright and it's not too annoying. Uh, and when you play it soft and gentle, you don't, again, with the action, you don't have the dynamic control. Some of it could be the patch, and some of it, I think, is the action. You don't have a dynamic control that you would have on, say, a real piano. But you probably didn't have that dynamic control on a CP80 either, so again, it's a bit forgivable. Um, and I think it just sounds absolutely wonderful, and I can pretty much guarantee you that you'll probably hear that sometime in the future in my music because I just adore that sound. Again, you can run out through all the effects too, the tremolo, the auto pan, the way the the two wahs, and you got the chorus, the phaser, and the delay. That would probably sound good with a little bit of a delay on it too and some reverb. That would sound really nice. And it also has an unreal amount of sustain that makes it really fun to play with. So I love the electric grand piano sample. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Up next is the clavinets, which I also enjoy. I feel like they aren't as good as they could be, but at the same time, I can't really think of a digital piano that does the clavinet better. So, I'm kind of at a crossroads there. Kind of like I am with the pedal. I think it could be better, but I also think it's adequate. So, this I think could possibly be a little bit better, maybe a little more crisp, a little more sharp sounding, um, but it's also pretty good. And it definitely sounds like a clavinet, and it sounds pretty authentic. <laughs> So you heard a little rendition of some classic rock and some Baroque music on the clavinet sound, and as you can hear, both of them worked very, very well. Um, the clavinet sound is really good, and like I said, I like it. I feel like it maybe could be a little bit more crisp and, and, and plucky sounding, um, but it's pretty great the way it is, honestly. Now we can talk about the clavy tabs button over here. When you push and hold that down, you see all these buttons line up. Sadly, I don't have a real Koner Clavinet D6 at the studio and I have very little experience with them. But I do know that on the original Honer Clavinet, you were able to change the sounds because it had, it was basically an electrified clavichord. Um, and you had pickups inside and you could change the location of the pickups, just like on a, a guitar, for example. Um, and you could change where those pickups were, were picking up the signal from the strings and change the sound of it just by flipping some buttons. So we have, when you push the clavy tabs button, all these light up because we have a brilliant setting, a treble setting, a medium setting, a soft setting, and then we have C slash D and A slash B all under the clavy tabs. If you disable everything except for the C slash D and the A slash B buttons, nothing happens.
but if you turn on anything else, the C slash D and A slash B buttons will begin to affect the sound, and of course you've got four different types of sound. You have the brilliance, and I'm going to run these without the C, D, and A, B buttons on. You have the brilliant sound effect here. You have treble. You also have a medium setting, which we'll hear by itself right here. And then we have the soft button, which is the same button as the clavinet button itself. Then of course you have the C slash D and the A slash B buttons, which will change the color of the tone. Let's have all four of the other settings activated with the C, D button. Ends now with only the A, B button. And now if I push the C, D button, we'll have the full rank of clavinet sounds and it will be the full sound that we heard at the beginning, which I've already played, so I won't play it again. So those are the clavinet sounds, and once again, you can run them through the effects and the other set of effects. You can combine them with the pads. You can also run them through the amp, which I'll talk about later in the video. Um, and you could EQ them if I knew how the EQ worked, slash if it worked at all. So those are the clavinet sounds, and I really like them a lot. I think they sound great. Again, a little bit of improvement could possibly be done, but they're very, very nice. Up next is another one of my favorite sounds on the Kumar 7, but in general, as far as musical instruments are concerned, it's not one of my favorite musical sounds. It's the sound of a Yamaha DX. On here, they just call it DXEP. Um, of course, the Yamaha DX7, there are a few different variants of it, but the DX7 was one of the first, if I remember correctly, it was modular, not modular, what am I looking for there? Um, it was a synth, it was like a synthesized instrument, so it made completely digital sounds, and it had one that emulated a Rhodes, but didn't really sound like a Rhodes, and it became its own thing, the Yamaha DX sound, and these days it's, you can find it in just about every 70s and 80s ballad ever, and it's a very famous sound. It's not one of my favorite musical sounds. It's just not my favorite. I don't hate it. I don't love it. But I love the one on the Krumar 7. Again, I like the, the Yamaha CP80. Generally not a big fan of it. I love, the, I love it on the Krumar. Same thing here. I love it on the Krumar. It's got a thick bass, a bright, beautiful, singing, pretty treble, and just all around. It's gorgeous. Have a listen. It's just fun to play, it's fun to listen to, and I absolutely love it. Um, and as far as pieces of music are concerned, what I'm going to do here is actually play a little excerpt from a song that somebody wanted me to play in my videos. If any of you guys know what it's from, let me know. I'm not going to tell you what it's from, and if you want more music like it, also let me know. So here's a little excerpt of that. Again, let me know if you know what it's from. I think that that goes pretty well with the DX sound, and it sounds very cute and happy. It works very well with the DX sound. I changed the harmony in the original. If you know what the original was, I changed the harmony in it a little bit um, to kind of hopefully maybe avoid a copyright claim. But there that is. There's the Yamaha DX sound. And of course, you can run it through all the different effects and all that stuff, which is great. Comes with a little bit of reverb on it too, which I think is a nice touch. Up next is an MKS EP, which before the Krumar 7, I had no clue what it was. And to be honest with you, I still know very little about it, but I believe it was a vintage electric piano from Roland. It was the Roland MKS. And I don't recognize this sound. I don't think I've ever really heard it before, but based on the sound, it kind of reminds me of the CP80, but more digital. Uh, and again, normally not the type of thing I'd probably like, but on the Krumar 7, it is lovely. <laughs>
That is such a cool sound and I absolutely love it. And to be honest with you, whether or not it's super authentic or completely far away from what the original MKS could do, either way it doesn't bother me because it sounds absolutely amazing and I love it. The sound of the bass is like rich and growly but also kind of thin sounding and transparent and interesting and the, the high treble is melodic and like the CP80 sound has an insane amount of treble and it's just, oh, I love it. It's perfect. It's so fun to play. And like I said earlier, the action doesn't have like an amazing dynamic response for everything. And maybe part of it's just getting used to it because when I was playing Wet Hands there, I didn't have any issues at all with dynamic response. Everything came out the way I wanted it to. And before I feel like I had a little bit of trouble with the MKS sound getting that to happen. So some of the issues I'm talking about with the, the action may just be getting used to it because it doesn't feel like any digital piano action I've ever played. Then as a result, there may be a small learning curve that can help with a dynamic response. I'm still sticking by what I say about the dynamic response not being amazing for all the sounds. I still think it's true with the electric grand, but I think maybe some of it is a learning curve as well because that went really great and sounded gorgeous and it was fun to play. Up next, we have a couple of sounds that as much as I love the Kumar 7, uh, I have to be honest, the last two sounds here are kind of afterthoughts. We have Vibes, which of course is Vibraphone, and we have Grand. And the Grand Piano sample on here, not sample, sorry, the Grand Piano patch is anything but Grand. But we'll get to that in a little bit. First, let's take a listen to the Vibes. Um, they sound more like a Celesta with a tremolo than Vibraphone, but they're still okay. I have a real Vibraphone. If I ever need a Vibraphone sound in a recording, I'm going to my M75. But... This has a vibraphone sound, let's check it out. The attention to detail though that Krumar has put into some of these sounds, including the ones that are afterthoughts, is honestly pretty incredible. In some of them, like the reeds and the clavi, if you noticed, when you play beyond the original low note of the instrument, you don't get any sound. For the reeds, that bottomed out at a low A, so anything below that low A makes no sound. The clavi sound as well, I forget exactly where it bottoms out, but... you don't get any sound for that lowest note there because the clavinet didn't go that low. And it's the same thing with the vibes. Anything below, if I remember correct, it's this low C, uh, has no sound. And anything from there on up to this high C has sound, and then everything beyond the high C has no sound. So it's basically a one, two, three, four, four octave vibraphone. Now the range is a little bit off compared to a real vibraphone, at least mine. I think mine goes down to this low F. It might be this F, but I think it's this low F. And then it goes up to a high F. Um, so the range is a little bit shifted and it sounds a little bit too clear and clean and pointy for a vibraphone. Vibraphones usually have a, a thick golden sound, um, but it's still pretty nice to listen to. And again, attention to detail here is impressive. On a vibraphone, if you take a mallet and you hit a bar to make a note without pushing the pedal down, you don't get any sustain. It's not like a piano where you push a key without pushing the pedal down, and as long as you have that key down, the note will ring out. Vibraphone's not like that. It's not that smart. You have to manually push the pedal down to get the notes to sustain. And the Kumar 7 is the same exact way. It's incredible attention to detail that no other piano manufacturer does, or acoustic electric piano manufacturer. If you play it without the pedal, you get very little sustain. There should be less, honestly. It should be more percussive, but you get less sustain. And if you hold the pedal down, you get more sustain. The amount of sustain when you have the pedal pressed down is pretty normal and it's very, very, very long, like a real vibraphone. When you have the pedal off and you play some notes, it should be very, very percussive and just like a boink, 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 like a pitched percussive attack. That's how a real vibraphone is, at least mine is, when you play it without pushing the dampers down. It creates a very percussive, almost like a, a metallic drum-like sound. Very, very interesting. And that's not quite what this does. You can still hear the tremolo as it's fading away, uh, but it's still kind of a cool sound. Bit of an afterthought, like I said, not the most realistic vibe sound I've ever heard, but still fun to play with, and the intention to detail there is really impressive. Finally, we have the grand sound, which, as I've said before, is honestly anything but grand. This is attempting to emulate a grand piano. And there's two ways you can look at it, okay? First of all, if you look at this sound, if you see the word grand, and you picture in your head a beautiful Busender for Concert Grand, or a Yamaha CFX, or a Fazioli F308, and you imagine it to be a recording of that that's still going to sound really good, 
you will be sorely disappointed. Uh, however, if you picture and you come up with the scenario of a recording of a piano being played through uh, the tinny speaker of a 1930s radio set, then you will be very happy because that's basically what this sounds like. And it's kind of both cool and also not very good at all. It's both ways. You know, if you want that kind of like a weird filtered, kind of a gritty, strange, offbeat piano sound, this is perfect. If you want a high fidelity keyboard that can do a really great acoustic piano sample, Again, boot this out of your wish list because it cannot do that whatsoever. It does have a MIDI out, so you could use it as a MIDI controller, which would be fun. Um, but as far as built-in sounds, yeah, that's not going to happen. Let's take a listen to the grand sound and stop ranting and let you guys listen to what you think of it for yourselves. The more and more I play it on the other sounds, like the electric grand and the grand sound that I just played just now, I feel like more and more that the dynamic response issue I had with the action is more of a learning curve than it is actually a serious flaw with the action. Again, it's not perfect, it's not going to be as good and as close of a replica to a real piano as, say, a Yamaha P515 or a Kawai MP11SE. It's not going to be a grand feel free action. But it works okay for classical music if that piano sample was better i'd say it was actually really great and if only it had a really good piano sample i'd say that this was a truly phenomenal keyboard however due to the lack of a really good grand piano sample i can't say that it's a truly phenomenal digital piano but i'm still going to say it's a very very good one um everything else even the vibes sound pretty good. Uh, the tines are phenomenal. The reeds are very good. Uh, the electric grand is wonderful. The clavinet sound is great. The DX EP is beautiful. The MKS EP is also even more beautiful. The vibe sound are decent and, well, we've already talked about the grand. It's not very good, but it's still fun to play. It still has an interesting sound. And I think if you're going for that vintage kind of a sound, that grand piano may be exactly what you want. Because if you listen to old rock music from the 50s and the 60s and even into the 70s and 80s, and shoot, even today, you listen to most pianos in pop music, in modern rock, whatever, they don't sound like a real piano. They sound like a digital piano. Even if it's a real piano in the recording, they've altered it and compressed it and thinned it down so you can cut through the mix. And it doesn't have any of the phenomenal qualities of a real piano, whatever the original thing that may have been recording. Um, so if you're looking for like a vintage kind of a 50s rickety piano sound, this is great. Uh, but again, if you're looking for a really fine-tuned high class acoustic piano experience through Kumar 7 is not for you. However, like I've said multiple times already, if you're looking for a vintage kind of a feel and a look without the the physical issues of a vintage piano, all the technical action work and, and the moving of the, uh, you know, it, with a real Rhodes, there's all kinds of things that can break, that will break, that you can adjust, that you should adjust, that you can adjust if you want to, you know, without all of that, if you're not into that kind of thing, I kind of enjoy it, but if you're not into that sort of thing and you just want a really good Fender Rhodes sound, I mean, hey, the Krumar 7 is awesome and it looks cool and it looks really cool on stage. So overall, I really enjoy the Krumar 7. Uh, I think it's amazing. I think it's not for everyone, though. Um, I've said this countless times in the video, and I don't think I need to say it anymore, but I will again. If you're looking for a piano experience, the Krumar 7 will not give you a piano experience. It's giving you a Fender Rhodes experience with extra sounds in here, and I didn't even know I could do that with a button, so that was kind of cool. If you're looking for a Fender Rhodes experience, and you're looking for that vintage sound, that vintage feel, that vintage look, I've said it four times already in the video. The Krumar 7 is awesome. 
Okay, but before I sign off the video and basically say goodbye, there is one more thing I wanted to do, and that is kind of to top off the vintage look of the Crew March 7. Right now I have it sitting on a Stellar Labs uh, keyboard stand. It's like an $88 keyboard stand. It's not actually usually the one I use in my videos, but it's just as good, if not better, than the ones I always use in my videos and have used for the past eight years. This is kind of a new one to me and I like it. You can extend it and it's very sturdy and you can raise the height of it. Um, and it's sitting on that. It's not sitting on its included legs. So I think what I'm going to do before we sign off on the video here is put it on its legs and see how sturdy they are and also what they look like and how easy the assembly process for them is. In the original Fender Road stage model, it was oh, terrible. I cannot put in the original Fender Rhodes stage model legs without a lot of help. Uh, maybe I'm just, maybe I have problems up in my brain or something. Other people can do it. I can't. Um, we'll see how easy this is to do. Hopefully it'll be easier. Hopefully they'll have redesigned the flaws of it and made it easier. Or maybe they won't have. So we'll check that out before I say goodbye in the video. So now it's time to try out the included legs for the Krumar 7. And the funny thing is, most of the weight of the Krumar 7 is not in the body like you'd expect, but I feel like it's in these legs. Um, the top case without the legs weighs 10 pounds, and the total instrument legs and lid included is around 53. So you take off the 10 pounds of the lid, that leaves you with 43 pounds. Without the legs on it, this is very, very light, even considering it's got a wood body. You start adding these legs on, and before it would balance just normally. Now, if I let go of it, it wants to fall. So, which makes sense, um, but it falls quite fast, and these are adding a lot of weight to it. So, these legs are really heavy duty, and so far have been very easy to put in. Um, they work on the same principle as the original stage roads did, where basically you just line it up to the hole, which is tricky to do with one hand, but we'll see what I can do here. Just line it up to the hole, and just tighten it and I think it's going in there. And uh, the original Rhodes, I had a huge problem putting these in because the hole, uh, it's kind of like this. You've got a diagonal shaped screw hole that's going into the underside of the Rhodes and then the, the metal bracing around it has a different angle to it that would make you think the leg goes in at a different angle than the screw hole actually wants you to. It's all shiny metal, so it's difficult to see what angle it's supposed to go into, and it was very difficult for me. Um, but on here, even when I'm propping up the instrument with one arm and doing it with my non-dominant hand, I can put the legs in just fine, so that's really great. Now we have all four legs in. There's no cross braces like in a real Rhodes, but I'm assuming Krumar decided, we don't need those. And... Let's put it on the ground and see how stable it is. So the Krumar 7 is now on its included legs, and to be honest with you, they look rather frail, but they're actually not. When you put a keyboard, a slab piano or a stage piano, on any sort of a stand, there's two different planes of movement that it can move in, two different directions it can move in. You can have front to back movement relative to the keyboard and side to side movement relative to the keyboard. One of those I feel is more important than the other, and I'll talk about that in a second, but first let me just show you more of the way the legs look. I think they look pretty cool. It really gives it that vintage kind of a look, and it's definitely extremely reminiscent now that it's up on the stand of a Fender Rhodes stage model piano. I've got those same metallic diagonal legs, uh, and it just looks really great. I think it looks fantastic, and uh, it's honestly absolutely wonderful looking. All right, so how stable is it? How sturdy is it? Well, when it comes to front to back movement, which is the more important one of the two, in my opinion, there's like none of it. When you're playing it, I'm not going to actually push the keys because it's on, it'll make noise, but when you're pushing on it and you're playing the keys, when you're playing it, you're not applying side to side movement, you're applying front to back movement. So if you have a wobbly stand that's wobbly front to back, as you play it, it's going to flop all over the place. If it's sturdy front to back like this one is, you won't have any problems whatsoever. So when I push it front to back, it actually would rather move side to side or scoot across the floor than it would move front to back. It doesn't want to wobble that direction direction at all, which is amazing. Now side to side movement, it does have a little bit of it as you can see here. If I get it in motion, you can see that it does wobble a lot. However, it's actually still pretty sturdy. I'm intentionally moving my hand in sync with its wobble to amplify the movement of it. And honestly, it's pretty sturdy. You don't really come across it wobbling at all when you're playing it. Now, if somebody walked by and bumped into the side of instrument, yeah, it would move a little bit. Um, but I don't think it moves enough to make it fall over, to make it break, or even to really disrupt your playing. It's not going to shift over enough that you'd miss an entire key, you'd probably be fine, especially if you saw the impact coming. Um, so it's from side to side movement, although it does have some, it's still very, very sturdy, and from front to back movement, it has literally none. So it's an impressively sturdy stand, and I think that's honestly really awesome 
that this comes with its own stand. Most digital pianos, especially in this price bracket, don't come with any stand at all. You need to have your own. Some of them do have an optional stand you can buy, and that usually costs a pretty penny. This one comes with it, and it's simple, high quality, and sturdy, and I don't think you can really ask more from a stand. And also, it's super portable. It's probably the most portable stand of any modern digital piano. It's really great. So with everything out of the way, that has been my review of the Krumar 7, and I've already told you what I think about it, so I'm not going to repeat myself and say it all over again, but I will say that it's amazing and that I absolutely love it. Um, so I really hope that you guys have also loved this video as well. I've had a lot of requests for the Krumar 7, but of course, it's a pricey instrument. It's not the top-of-the-line flagship Dexy Bell keyboard price, but it's also... It's not a Yamaha P125. It's not under $1,000. I actually got mine for a little bit less than they normally go for, and it was still pushing $2,000. Um, so it's definitely an expensive keyboard, and if you guys want to see me do more expensive keyboard reviews like this, I've gotten some requests for the Viscount Legend 70s. I've gotten some requests for the Nord Grand, which is a little bit more expensive, um, but within the same price bracket and kind of the same idea as well. And there's also another cool one that maybe I'll get, maybe I won't get, probably won't get because it's really expensive, but it's made in Germany. It does the same sort of thing as this does. It's, it's the Waldorf Zarenborg, and it's interesting. Um, if you guys want to see more interesting keyboard reviews like this that are a little bit out of the loop and out of the ordinary P515 stuff I always do, definitely subscribe, definitely give this video a like, and definitely keep watching my videos because there'll be lots more cool things to come. You probably won't see videos like this on interesting rare instruments like this every single day, um, but hopefully you will still enjoy the videos I put out. I usually do videos of acoustic pianos, electric pianos, digital pianos like this one, and all kinds of other cool stuff, including oddball instruments. I just recently did a video about a concertina. So if you like my videos, you might want to think about subscribing if you're not already, and if you do subscribe, thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.